It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Leia Krieger. Your maiden name was Schlomowitz. Okay. And um, your family were those who were saved by Sugihara. Yes. So if you could tell us a little bit about, uh, about the family history. Yes, so my father was born in Ganyets. It was a small like village, I guess, in, in Poland. When he was nine years old, he, was, he had a twin brother. And they both very much were together all of their lives. They went to the Mary Yeshiva together. They, my, they were actually sent to Yeshiva at a very young age because they lived in Ganyets. My um, grandfather, my father's father, was a Rav. And the, but it was a small village. There was no yeshiva. There were no. They they got a malamid to teach them. But from the way I hear it, the history they were a bit wild, and the malamid couldn't control them. So when they were nine years old, they were sent away to yeshiva at a very young age. I'm not a hundred percent sure if they were sent at that age to Mir. I, maybe it was first a different yeshiva, and then later on they went to Mir. But they. They were there from quite a young age and they weren't home that much afterwards because the traveling was expensive. My father used to talk very much about his mother's his mother's parents. They used to go there for like Shavuot so when it was a Yuntif because it was too far for them to travel home. And um, let me see. So. I don't know at exactly what age my father went to Yeshiva Smir, but he was there with his twin brother, who was my uncle Avram. And my father's name was Ephraim. And Baruch Hashem, we have quite a lot of grandchildren Can named Ephraim. Father? Um, you know? A little, you could, yeah. Okay, he, could so he talk so about I'm introducing uh, Pinchas. Pinchas. <clears throat> Okay, I just want to say about her father's father, uh, who was the Gun Yitzhak, his name was uh, Rav Yisrael Zalman Shlamovitz. Um, there was a write-up that I picked up uh, a number of years ago in a, uh, I don't know if it's a country or a sefer, which is Tarez Chesed, printed in, uh, in, in Lodz in 1929, Tafresh Pei where inside there is a write-up of uh, her father's father and in the middle of the uh, article there's a picture of uh, her father's father, Yisrael Zalman Shlomovitz, who was the Ganyan Sirav. Now, her father's father printed a sefer called Beis Yisrael, which was printed, and this is the first printing, it was printed in Vilna, in Tafresh Pevav, 1926. It's on uh, Sugi Sashas, and then it, again it was reprinted in Shanghai, which I have a copy, in yeah. 1944 Tafshin Dalit. And I believe that in this edition they added something that was not in the original edition. Let me just find it. This was the second one was printed in Shanghai. This my father, my father and my no, no, uncle. No, 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 no. This, this is the original one printed in Tafresh Peva of 1926. I know, but the one in Shanghai, my that. father I'll, did. No? Oh, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I believe so. It could yes. be. That, that could be. But yeah. they also added something over here, which was not in the original printing in 1926, which is Chidush Taira over here. As you can see, and this is printed in Shanghai, Tafshin Dalit. Now, in America, her father, Rabbi Shlaim Shlomowitz, and her uncle, Rabbi Vrom Shlomowitz, reprinted Tfus uh, Tzilum, which is a facsimile of the original printing. They reprinted it in 1968, which Thank is uh, just a facsimile. And on the, uh, in the, in the uh, they dedicated a page to all the uh, children that uh, unfortunately uh, were murdered. I mean, her, her father was one of eight siblings and uh, the only, only three of them remained. Uh, her father, her father's brother, twin brother Avram, and uh, her father's sister, who was married to her Rav Nassim Wachtweigl, the Mashkiach of Lakewood. And unfortunately, her father's father and the rest of the children 
were, were killed. So this is a page dedicated to their memory. And this is a reprinting of the original Sefer. Now, just last year, Tafshim Pei, this is uh, her ne her, my wife's nephews, which would be the grandchildren of her, Rabbi Ephraim Shlom was, or of the author, great grandchildren, uh, repr reprinted the reset type on the entire Sefer, uh, Beis Yisrael. And this is the uh, new edition printed in 2020, Tafshim Pei. Great. Those are my brother's children that did that. Now, uh, I, as a collector of Sarm and, and, and Rashi al uh, have one sefer which is on Rashi, which was printed in Shanghai, which is the Maral Sefer Gura Arye. Uh, actually, I have the original one, the first printing, which was printed in Prague, Shin Lam which is uh, 1578. But this one was printed in Shanghai. The paper, paper is brittle, as uh, it was printed in, uh, let me see if it has a date, Tafshin Vav, Tafshin Vav. That's what it looks like, 1946. Here is the uh, print printing and uh, as you can see the paper is brittle it's it's actually this is a reprint uh, of which edition I'll tell you in a minute uh, let's see Gur Arye. one second uh, Yehuda Yehuda Levoy that was that was the morale's name so in my Sefer Parashandasa, which is a bibliography of all the Purushim that exist on Rashi al Torah, Chelek Aleph, from the beginning of printing until Tav Shim Lam in 1970, uh, if we go to Yehuda, Yehuda Levi, okay, so the first printing is Prague, Shin Lam et Ches, uh, okay, then then it was printed in Lvov. It's not clear, but Lvov Tafresh Yudches would be uh, seventeen. Wait, uh, uh, let's see, sixteen. No, eighteen, eighteen, and I believe yes. This is a reprint. Uh, actually, they they had a very. It wasn't a facsimile. It 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 was. Uh, I don't know how they printed it there, but this is a, it's, if you want to call it a facsimile of the re reprinting of the uh, Lvov printing of uh, Tafresh Yudches of 1858. Um, okay, it's interesting you can, that you can they continue. had so many Svarim in, in they had a, They had a lot of Svarim. Where Matter did they get them all from? Does this have Chinese letters in the back? That's what I'm <laughs> curious about, because that's what I remember as a child. Was very brittle. No. No. It does in the binding, not in the actual. Oh, I'd have to safe. open. Up, I'd have to open up the binding. Oh, okay. Because some of them, once you opened it up, you you, see, you, you yeah. saw that inside. Yeah. And you have the the original. This is. I I I I I was a rabbi and an English teacher. I I, I was a malamid for forty four years. So after I started teaching in Tafshi and Lamed Dalad, I believe nineteen seventy four. Um, as a Malamid, I taught Chumash Rashi, and um, the first, and, and I used to teach the same parashis, Chayisara through Vayechi. Uh, and then I would tell them in the afternoon the, the story of the parashis HaShavua. So for my own knowledge, I uh, wanted to do a little bit more, so I, I, I used to learn twice a week with a friend of mine who, had a, who taught a parallel class, we used to learn Medjish Shabbat. But then afterwards, after teaching 10 years, I wanted to delve more into Pirusha and Rashi al So that's, why, that's when in Tafshi Memdalad, I started looking for Pirusha and Rashi al And as time went by, um, I saw that I was able to pick up an old Sefer that was printed in the 1700s for $50, $100. Wow. So uh, that's how that began. And you must give, it must give you a lot of nachas to see the original of your your grandfather's safer it's just unbelievable i guess so you know it's, it's interesting <laughs> it's incredible so now, what do you remember of your father telling you about how he was saved he used to talk about shanghai a lot a, a lot i remember like um 
by the Shabbos yes. table. He would just tell us stories. He didn't talk much about the loss of his family. I guess that was very painful and we were small children. So he used to tell us interesting stories about Shanghai and, and what happened there. And, and for example, it was hot, but they used to drink hot drinks. I don't know why the theory was that if it's hot outside and you drink a hot drink, you'll cool off. But I do remember he used to talk a lot about the heat in Shanghai and my brother, I spoke to my brother, he remembers that when the bus would stop you had to hold on to your hat because otherwise someone would steal the hat. And he would tell us stories like that that were interesting and you know I guess, I don't know if the word is fun, but you know, a little bit lighter. Um, I guess that's how it was in those days. My father wasn't one to talk a lot about sad things to the kids. Did he speak about Sugi or um, so he the Dutch consul Zwartendijk? He didn't talk a lot about Sugihara, but I knew, of course I knew the name, and he definitely spoke about how they got visas. We all knew that story. How did they get visas? So from, I didn't remember the details, but I asked my brother, and my brother told me from, uh, from what he knows, because originally there was someone in the yeshiva, Zupnik, and he went and he got visas was for Moshe Zupnik. Moshe Zupnik for almost everybody. But then the situation got very dangerous. So he had to leave. He, 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 I guess he left. I don't know exactly where he went to, but he left. Uh, were they in Kovna? Or he left. So, um, so then my father was there with my uncle and they did not have visas and for what I understand they got, my father pay, actually paid somebody to go to, because they knew you had to go to Sugahari, he paid them, paid this person, whoever it was to get, and I think, I'm not sure if he got all 30 visas, but he got visas for himself and his brother and for some other people that were missing visas. And so then they, they got those visas. And when my father was much older, I never heard this as a child, but he expressed very deep regret that because he had two other brothers there, that he didn't get visas for them. But it was kind of like this yeshiva went like, you know, they everybody stayed with their yeshiva. So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know if, my father was able to get them visas and he didn't, or it was just a feeling that, you know, just because he survived and they didn't, maybe he were, just... Were they at other yeshivas, the two other brothers? Yeah, so they were in uh, with um, uh, Baranovich, I think. Um, I wrote it down one minute. They, um, wait, could you shut it off for a second? No, 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 it's all good. Oh, okay, um, yeah, so the two brothers, they they unfortunately died during the war. They were in... in Bravanovich. Bravanovich. And with Rabbi Elchanan Vassman. And Rabbi Elchanan Vassman actually came back from America to join his yeshiva. And my grandmother, she never stopped talking about it because she met him. And she said there were two such chash of a yidin. And they could, because my, my grandparents were in Brighton Beach. My grandfather was a rub in Brighton Beach. And she said they came That's with... That's your mother's father. My mother's, my mother's mother right. said that they came to collect money in America and such hush of, uh, and I guess, I don't know facts, but my grandparents, my grandfather was a rub, so maybe they stopped there. And they came to collect money and they were such nice, wonderful Rabbanim, and then they got killed afterwards. So she met Rib Elkanan when he came to America. Could be. You know, I don't want 100% mm. vouch for that story, but I remember hearing that from my grandmother. Did your father ever speak about the train ride from... Uh, All the time. The, the fast to train. To Vladimir Bostock, uh, from uh, Moscow to Vladimir yes, Bostock, it was and a, to Japan. It was a very fast train. That's what he told us. And um, it was a very long train ride. It was they, like uh, nearly two weeks. Yeah, they were on the train for a long time, but I, I don't know a lot of details about the train ride. But and Japan, I, did he speak about Japan at all? Yeah, he said they were very good to them in Japan. Mm. They came to Japan, but they weren't happy. They didn't know what to do with them because um, I guess they came to Japan and they welcomed them and they treated them very nicely. He always talked very favorably about the Japanese. 
But then um, they were under a lot of pressure what to do with the Jews, because remember, Japan was allied with the Nazis, so this was a problem for them. So from my understanding from my father is that the Japanese themselves were not anti-Semitic, but they were under a lot of pressure from the Nazis. So eventually, Shanghai was an open city, and I believe it was at that Japan was so they sent them to Shanghai, and and actually the conditions in Japan, from what I understand, were better than what it was in Shanghai. In Shanghai, it was more difficult. And did your you have to speak about the, the original mayor learning in the original mayor? Oh, no. in, in and you know, that's an interesting question. Didn't talk a lot about that. All I know about the mirror is, I, I, I don't know how, it was It was hard times, but I know that he always used to say his whole life that the learning in Shanghai was better than anywhere else because all they did was focus on the learning. There was nothing else in their life. And they learned from day to night, a whole day. In fact, there's this famous story, my father, this, um, they were supposed to go home to, there's two versions of the story, so I don't know which one is correct. Either they were in yeshiva and they were supposed to go home, but they said, no, ben, let's ben stay. Ben Astar. Ben Astar, they said, no, let's stay and learn a little longer. Or they were supposed to, they were, they were home and they said, let's go to yeshiva. But whichever the version is, they went to go learn. And while they were in yeshiva, they were supposed to be home, but they were not. Their, their home got bombed. The apartment that they, the place that they were oh, staying really? was bombed. Because at the end of the war, I, the Americans bombed Shanghai. It, yeah. it was bombed. And also there were times when there weren't enough food, this is for sure, I know that, and, and um, Rav Kalmanovich, my father used to talk a lot about Rav Kalmanovich, he was a very strong force and, and he said something like, Yidin, Yidin, effin the hen, something like that, he was very powerful, he, he used to raise money for the Miri Yeshiva. He raised the money that actually paid for the journey to go to Vladivostok. But mm. so there was a problem at one point with the money because they were they didn't want to give them money because they were foreign, they, it was wartime, they were foreign entities. Yeah. So there were times when there were delays and, and there were, I don't think they ever never had anything to eat, but there were times when it was very bit symptom. You know, they had little to eat. And my father came back, my father was six feet tall, and from what my mother says, I, I don't know, I wasn't there, I wasn't born yet, but she said he weighed 129 pounds. Wow. And when he came to the U.S., they gave him vitamins, you know, shots to uh, make him stronger. What you said about the learning, yeah. so I heard, and Pinkas, you, you knew Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, they said that the learning in Shanghai for the mirror was it was the highest, the, the most Unbelievable. incredible my, It was. And, and my, you know, my brother told me this just today. He said that um, when they came from Japan to Shanghai, they came by boat. And a lot of the boys came. They weren't feeling well. They, I, I don't know to what extent. And Rav Haskell got up and he said, it's Elo. And he pulled the yeshiva together. My father always used to talk about Rav Chatzka when he used to say, Elo, like the ground would shake. And there was such a... Uh, so he, he was very strong also, and, and he pulled them together. And they were, for their, they were one big family in Shanghai. They didn't know what happened to the... At, the, at that point in the war, they had no clue what happened to the rest of their families. And they were like family to each other, and that remained till till the end of my father's days. The the Aldemir, they they all went to each other's simchas. They helped each other. They were they were unbelievable, unbelievable, very devoted. Can I just ask me because when when you see here Reb Chaim Shmulevitz's droshes or Yishirim, did he speak about Shanghai and the learning? Never. Rav Chaim was fully immersed in Tyra <laughs> and nothing else but Tyra. But uh, did he schmooze about it ever? Or? Never, never. 
he would give a, a shir, a shmuz Sunday night at the end of second Seder. He'd give a shir klali Thursday night at the end of second Seder. I'll tell you one, one, and and then he'd give many vaden during the week in his uh, in his house. Um, Friday night after after, I believe it was after Kabbalah Shabbos. Um, it was before my he'd uh, he'd give a shmuz in his house for half an hour, forty five minutes. Then he'd go back into the Smedish and and daven daven Um But but no, he never seen it, never spoke about him there. I mean, not 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 openly in the yeshiva. I mean, maybe privately. Maybe that I don't know. Wow. But I tell you, he but he was. A matter of fact, his Adam was Rab Nachman Patzavitz. In my days, I came of Tavshin Chavches, which was August of 1968. The entire yeshiva that existed was I was approximately 250 Bachim and Young Light. Um, there were two shiurim, Rab Arya Finkel, who was a uh, son of, of, of Chazab, Chaim Zefinkel, and uh, he gave the first year, and Reb Nachum Patsavitz gave the, the next year. So, um, the winter of Tavshin Chavtes, I went to Reb Arya Finkel's share. Weren't, weren't about 11, 12 Bachram in the share, but we went downstairs into a, uh, a room, I mean, there were, there were dormitory rooms, and at the end, there was one room that was used for a share where he would say a share. No heat. You uh, opened your mouth, smoke came out of it from the coldness. And uh, the second share was, was Rab Nachum. Rab Nachum would say a blot share every day. And uh, Sunday, at the end of first day, that he would say a share clearly. Uh, Rab uh, Nassim Svi Finkel just sat and learned all day long was not involved in any any uh, monetary matters in the yeshiva or anything his shve who was the, the officially the rosh yeshiva of that was all all that was his headache um and all all that uh light upon him he sat and learned all day long a matter of fact there were three rows of benches. Rav Nassim sat in the second bench. I sat in the fourth bench. And actually, he had a vad where we—I uh, don't remember how many bachim were in the vad. Uh, eight or ten, about eight bachim. We used to meet like early Friday afternoon, and uh, he had a chabura, so we'd uh, sit and learn together. At that time, Rav Nassim lived on a chov Yisabracha ten. In late, later years, when he was not well, uh, the, he lived across the street from the yeshiva. But uh, I heard that someone had once asked him in the days when he wasn't well, and he really wasn't well. He came to America on a wheelchair to raise money for the yeshiva, and uh, someone asked him, "How do you learn Torah such with, with such yisurim?" So he said, "I learned. I don't learn Torah mitach yisurim. I learn Torah. I learn Torah mitach ahava." Wow. Hey, you have pictures of your of your father and your mother? Sure. So my mother was American. My mother was born in the U.S. She went to Lincoln High School. She a public and school. And her parents? Where did her parents come from? My your grandparents? So I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, Austro-Hungary, I think, um, because I know that my my great grandfather. This has to be was drafted into the Kaiser's army and he didn't like it there. So this is an interesting story. So he, this is from World War I though, it's a different war. So he, he, he um, what's the word, he deserted. So he came home and my grandmother was a little girl then, about eight or nine years old and she never stopped talking about this. They came looking for him and he was hidden in the house under a bed or something like that. And the soldiers were outside. And when they came, my grandmother said to them, why are you here? They said, we're looking for your father. Where's your father? So she said, you're supposed to know where my father is. Why don't you know where he is? He, he's supposed to be with you. And then she started screaming and, and hollering, where's my father? Where's my father? What'd you do? You know, and, and 
Meanwhile, he was hidden in the house. So she basically saved his life because they left. So my grandmother was quite a spunky lady. And that was my mother's mother. So I had this picture here I showed you. This is from one of my children's weddings, my second daughter. Here's a picture. I'm sure I have lots more pictures, but this is the one I found. Uh, this is my mother and okay. my oh, father. Do uh, oh, you want me to hold yeah, it up? Please. And my second daughter at her wedding. That's my mother and my father. Actually, at that wedding, that's that's uh, Chaya Feige. That's her daughter, Chaya Feige Sasha, who's married to Moshe Sasha. And they're married uh, approximately 24 years? Something like that. Something like that. And he is still learning in the mid. Yeah, my, it's interesting because my son in law, today. my son in law, who's in this picture here, here he is, yeah. he learns in the mirror, which was to, my father's to, yeshiva. To this very day. Yes. And, can just, oh, I'm not holding it well. And the mirror can you Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes, they, 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 they live here. They live here in Yushalayim. And he's learning to this very day. To this, to very, this day. very day in the Mary Yeshiva. So I'm sure my father has nachas up in Shemayim. Tremendous nachas. Wow, yeah. that's unbelievable. And this is a, um, there was a very, I couldn't locate it, but there's a picture of my father's family. There were eight siblings. If I do locate it, I'll give you a copy. A but picture there of are, your grandfather and the eight siblings. And the eight children that were and, in and my... The, the reason that picture was taken was because the photographer of the city wanted to take a picture of the Rav. And her grandfather, grandfather Are you was... you sure? The, that's what I heard. It was the Gan Yitzhak Rav. All right. So he took the picture and that's how the family got the picture. Because wow. I heard... It, 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 someone told me that somebody in America wanted that picture. That's why they check, took it. Because it wasn't brother, a so. common thing to sit mm -hmm. for a picture. But there is a picture I just... And I have it. I just don't know where. This is um, Rabbi David Kfiat's wedding. Okay. And uh, I'm not uh, actually sure if this was taken after the war, during the war. But this is my father. Um, I recognize him right here. This man standing here. This is all, this is Mary Yeshiva people, and I guess he was one of the first to get married. So, Rabbi David Kviat. This was in, in America. That is in America, wow. It's this in is, America? This is straight after the war, Miss Fribley. Um, it, it, it had to have been right after the yeah. war. It, how can you tell it's in America? This is in the bottom. Uh, no, that's just it was in a, the newspaper that it was in. Oh, okay. I don't know where this picture came from. You know what? I can find out from my brother yeah. when when he got married because there were there were several people that got married during the war. Yeah. In fact, I don't know who it was, but somebody had twins in Shanghai. Uh, there were a few. Most of them got ma didn't get married during the war. Most of them got married after the war, but there were. No, there was this yeah. Rabbi Rab 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 from South Africa. His parents yeah. got married in Shanghai. Yeah, there were some. So I, I actually don't know. I don't know the answer to that, where it was. And um, there's nothing... I can't... Can you tell... If, I can't really tell. I don't know. Okay, it's amazing. And so, then, did your father speak about um, the Beit Midrash in Shanghai? So I don't. Um, I remember it was a big building, and there were and enough seats for. There was enough place for every single Talmud. It's, it's unbelievable. It's I believe so. Every yeah. Bochum, there was a. Yeah, yeah. It was a nice. It was a total nice. That they, that they had that. There was somebody. This story I didn't hear from my father. I read this somewhere. That somebody had a dream, and, and he dreamt, him, and and his father came to him in a dream, and, he and, bolted, yeah. and there was an empty base medrash, and they found it, and they learned it. All I can tell you is the learning was very intense. Despite all the difficulties, they learned from the morning to the night, and that was all they did. And and then my brother told me this today. So about the hakafas of Simchas Torah, he said the walls were sweating, like they were. It was with great hitlavut. <laughs> so so um, it was. You know, it's so interesting because my father actually. All in all, his mem the memories of the war were terrible, but the memories of Shanghai were not. He, he usually was happy when he spoke about Shanghai. 
There was one story about there was a boy that was very, very sick, and then Rav Chaskel davened for him, mm-hmm. and then he got better. And, and I think Rav Chaskel was almost like a father to them in many ways. And he was, of course, you know, they looked up to him tremendously. Wow. And, um, Did he speak about the Amshana Verebi or other Rabbanim? Not so much. Uh, I don't remember that. Could be he did. You know, I, 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 I don't remember. And later, did he speak about when they found out that the family, because it must have been very hard, they didn't know, they were cut off and they, you they know, didn't know like that. You know, he didn't when I was young. As I said, when I was young, he, but I, later on, I heard he was talking about Rav Chaim, um, Rav Chaim, my father's good friend, Rav Chaim, now I'm not remembering the last name, but it's at the tip of my mind. Rav Chaim, whatever, and he was the lucky one. Why was he lucky? Because he was an orphan before the war. That's what he said. So that was kind of like gallows humor. So Rav Chaim Prizhansky, he was such a nice man. So he was one of my father's very good friends, and I remember hearing that he was lucky because he was an orphan. So from that I was able to deduce that the ones that heard about the loss of their family, it was very hard for them. You know, and they didn't exactly know when the yard site was, but... Um, um, wow, and when, when your father came to America, mm-hmm. um, what did he do when he came to America? He came with his brother, they were... They he were, came with his twin brother. They learned to get in the mirror in Shanghai. Yeah, he stayed with the mirror, really, pretty much till he got married. Then he tried a number of things. They weren't terribly successful. I think he had a wine business at one point, and he cut diamonds. I remember going to visit the diamond cutting factory with him. Um, he eventually he became he he became a teacher. He he taught in Yeshiva Rambam, which is, was a day school then, and my uncle Avram also taught there. Later on, my uncle Avram started teaching in in Elizabeth, New Jersey. There was a school also started by uh, Amira, and um, but when I I I actually went to Yeshiva Rambam as a child, and a lot of the teachers there, they were from the Mir Yeshiva. So it was very hush of a, very hush of a staff there. It was actually quite remarkable. And a lot of your father's friends w- through the years must have been him that were in Shanghai with him. Oh, sure. They, they kept such a close Kesher all the years. They helped each other. I mean, the stockbroker he used to call, I forget, I forget the names. I'm so bad at names, I apologize. But, but he used to call and they would schmooze and, and they helped each other so much. I mean, for example, if somebody bought a house, I don't remember the details, but the other person would lend them money and they would pay back. And, and they were they were really like family. Like to, family. They were family because they didn't have family. This was their family. A lot of them were alone. And and the learning was always very... My father actually, we lived in Flatbush, which was near the Mary Yeshiva of Flatbush. So my father, his whole life, until he was very old and couldn't anymore, he used to walk. It was between 10 and 15 minutes, I would say. And he davened in the Mir Yeshiva, but when my father davened in the Mir Yeshiva, I'm not talking just Shacharis. Shacharis, Mincha, Mairev, always exactly on time. And then later on when he stopped teaching, he would he would learn his whole life, have Sidurim. And that was his life. His life was Torah and learning and always had a tremendous Hashivas for Torah. And when your father when uh, he saw the emergence of the America in, in, in Yerushalayim and how just from 250 Bochrim that Pinchas you were at originally in the 60s to the greatest... Um, now that's actually interesting. Did, he, did, he uh, did him a my lot of father to... Did my father ever talk about that? I don't remember. My father... Uh, I'm not sure because because when Pinchas went to learn in Yerushalayim, it, was a, it wasn't so big. I mean, the Mir Yeshiva in America was approximately mm-hmm. the same size. We were always more connected to the Mir Yeshiva in America. 
my mother was very good friends with Rebetzin Birnbaum, you know, Rip Schmuel Birnbaum's mm. Rebetzin. They were very close. And your father and must have been close with uh, Kalmanovitz, or about Kalmanovitz. Yeah, I guess. You know, I, I, I don't really know mm. so much, but, but they, um, I suppose so, yeah. And, and I'm trying to think. Did he talk? He didn't talk so much about the Mary Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. So much, except that Rav Haskel left to go to Yerushalayim, and that was a big loss, I think, for the people here in America. That he did talk about when he made the decision to go. But I don't think my father had thoughts of coming to Eretz Yisrael. He used to come visit here quite a lot because I have a brother living here. Mm -hmm. So they used to come visit. Um, and when he came to visit, did he, did he visit the mirror? I'm sure he did. Oh, I'm sure he did. I mean, when, when I was, uh, well, when I was growing up, they didn't come very often. I think that when I was in high school, it was the first time my parents went together. People didn't go as much then, and I suppose financially it w wasn't always possible. And they they came when I was in high school, they were here for three weeks. So I'm sure he went to the Maria. I can't imagine that he didn't. People I, didn't fly so much then. Yeah, was, I know. It was very, it was... Our, I came in August of 68 of Tavshin Chavches. I stayed straight three years, minus two weeks, I went home of Tavshi and Lamed Aleph. And I'm sure you, you hardly ever phoned, it was safe I spoke to my father twice yeah. in those three years. Once he called me, once I wanted to call him, I had to go to the Doa Rashid, the main post office on Rechov Yafo, stand in line, yeah. and uh, it was, he, spoke, he went into this big booth, cost then four dollars a minute, and I spoke for two minutes. But we used to write letters every week. No emails. <laughs> right, those blue letters. Aerograms. Yeah, I remember. So, um, and then when you look back on the whole miracle with Sugihara and uh, and the whole visa story, I'll just show a picture of Sugihara. You know, I, the way I think of it always in my life, in, in my mind, Remember when I heard all this, I was small. I was a little girl. Can you say but I, so? I, yes, I think of the Holocaust as being very black and dark and scary and, and very terrible. And Sugahari, he's like a light. A beacon of light. A beacon of light in the middle of all that darkness. That's how I look at it. Like how a person could be such a tzaddik and and remember those were dangerous times he took a tremendous risk I mean we know that he lost his money but for all we know it could have been more scary than sure. that we, we don't know what he was risking and and it went against his government sure and it was wartime and it, it just somehow it gives you hope it, it, it gives you hope in humanity that they could be such a good person in such dark times. I think that's that's such a beautiful message. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So I just want to thank you both. I, I want to add a couple of things. Sure. <clears throat> Leia's grandfather, her father's father, the Gan Yitzirov, had written a big chibur on Masech the Gitten, which um, was at the printer when the uh, war broke out and unfortunately it didn't survive so there is no there is no copy of it but he wrote uh, he wrote a big chib on Masech to Gittin. in other words it was another safer right it was another safer it, thick safer. so they have this one and but they don't have the second one the family should i mention this <laughs> you know when I was here, this is not on the video, right? Are we? No, here? sure. I just want to. Well, I just want to thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Should I mention anything about the? Uh, I'm going to do a separate. Um, oh. A little, oh, okay. Just, sure, just sure. Thank you. Okay, is this so, on now? Sure. Oh, but you could cut things, right? If you don't you, like. There's nothing to cut. It's just incredible. <laughs> so I just want to. I'll just come in for a second. Okay. Um, sure, sure, sure. So I just want. I just want to. Uh, okay. I just want to thank you both for giving me the opportunity to hear such an amazing, amazing story and to see the original that you have it, it's just unbelievable. But your story gives so much hope and um, 
you see the outcome of Nisim, pure Nisim. And um, just to hear, it's, it's, it's living history. You, you know, it's history. really interesting that you're doing this. What started you on this path? <laughs> <laughs> to, to hear these stories and to meet people whose, whose father, from a piece of, if you think about it, this visa's for life, a piece of paper saved your father and his brother. It's just unbelievable. And somebody who had Hasidim Talam, it's just, it's incredible. And to meet the descendants, you're, it's just amazing. It really is. It's something, um, it's such a privilege and honor. And I want to thank you both so much for giving me the opportunity to hear your most incredible uh, family history. Thank you. So special of you. Wow. Thank you so much. I, I think I should thank you. No, 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 no. It's been, you it's took been me, incredible. You know, it's, it's honestly, I, I, I love my father so much. And in a certain way, talking about this brings him back. And I, and I feel like he's standing right here. He, he was a very special person. You can't really understand it. Unlike. And he wasn't bitter that what he went through and how his family... No. No, That's he was... Uh, to the end of his days, he was the most generous kind and that's why I say as a child he never wanted to tell us anything sad so he only told us happy things about Shanghai and he, no he was not bitter no not in the least even though he lost his parents and no his, he was of course he was sad, sad so. he was sad sometimes and when he would get together with his sister and his other brother sometimes they would talk about the war but but he was never bitter he was always the kindest person most generous I think that's that's one of the most amazing outcomes of, and how you remember the learning and how the learning sustained. They sustained the Yidden in, in Shanghai. And he was alive when he learned. It wasn't quiet sitting and learning, it was arguing strong, you know. <laughs> but you know, can I just mention, I think the most amazing thing is to think that you have family that are learning in the mirror today. I think this is the testament to, yeah. to not only did he go through, but that he passed it down to future generations. Yes, and I also have a grandson learning in the mirror too, so yes. So your, your parents from above must be uh, such simchas and they must be smiling from, they are smiling from above. I hope, yeah. <laughs> thank you so anyway, much. Anyway, thank you.